So um, we got some questions sent in ahead of time, but before we go through those, uh, we want to open it up to the audience to ask any questions whatsoever. I'm going to walk. We're going to walk around with a mic so everybody can hear you. Um, but we'll bring up others. I think um, Adam, you can come up, and and Susie maybe, and and Aaron, Ron, uh, and depending on the question, we'll we'll get it answered. But uh, who out there has a question? I'll come around with a mic. But when we move and we downsize, we specifically look for one floor. So on the edges of each of these buildings, I would pay more rent to have one that wasn't a two-story. And I'm 70 plus, 70 years. <laughs> and I don't want to go into a retirement home yet. While this is interesting, it's not compelling to me. Because as we move out of the house where we've raised a family, I'd like to not have to go up and down stairs. I don't mind storing things in a basement, but I'm so I love this idea, and just add on the edge of each one, two wings, two flat apartments, or condominiums, that people like us would pay a lot more in rent than in the middle. I love that. Um, we thought of that. And so we actually do have um, two and three bedrooms on the ends that are first floor, no stairs. And thank you for saying that you'll charge, you'll pay more rent for that because now we will, we will charge more for those units. So thank you for saying that. Um, but yes, you're right. You know, we we have thought about people who don't want to do stairs. So our middle apartmentiums are kind of the two-story townhomes with lots of stairs, and then on the ends we've bookend them with some first-floor entry, no stair apartmentiums for people who don't want to go up and down. Yeah. I think the other thing you're seeing in that space too is a lot more four-story apartments with elevators um, and so it's making it more accessible we, we have a development up in Sioux Falls with a, another sponsor where we actually want underground parking four stories high so we can get that elevator and actually target it's, it's a similar kind of all-encompassing you know your your electric your all of your utilities are one price and we were, we're really kind of targeting that 55 plus where you want to downsize, but you may not want to you know, take the stairs, underground parking, so it kind of services as your garage, but then you can take an elevator to any floor. Also uh, helps in just the move in and move out process too. Of, you're not beating up every wall uh, every couple of months with somebody moving in and out uh, of the long hallway type of uh, building, so. Yeah. Jerry, you got a question? Yeah. Uh, is there a typical life cycle life cycle for multi-family development and rentals? And if so, where are we now? That's, that's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it's a good question. So multifamily has been on a good run for a decade or more. Um, and, and housing probably has been too. I think what's happened in much of that space is that we just, we haven't built enough. We didn't build enough coming out of the downturn to keep up with what the demand was going to be. And then the demographic shifts became, you know, really aggressive. So the, the 62 and over crowd is a really big demographic and and the uh, and the millennial crowd is a very big demographic and 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 the universe hasn't, we haven't successfully found, we haven't built enough in order to accommodate all of that demand. And so you typically would think of, I would typically think of this as being, you know, a 10 or a 15 year curve. I think it's, I think we probably have been in it for that long, but I don't, I mean, there's smart people in the room here. I don't really know what changes that in the near term. Certainly, I think rents are gonna settle down again at some point. Um, and the affordability question will become a bigger and bigger question as we go forward. I, I think there's no question about that. Um, but I don't, I, it's hard to imagine, short of like a massive interest rate change, um, that would change the uh, that would change that would change the the number of people. So what I've said a few times, I've said I think that our occupancies will will be really good. What I what I would be a little worried about is at what point is the population's earning sufficient to pay the rent that we need to charge. And I think that's kind of yet to be determined. It's a bit of a non-answer, but. Other questions? I've got some really good good ones queued up, so oh if you think of any, let me know. I'm going to ask the first one here. Oh, so 
You've heard the term apogee and metonic. What is the difference between apogee and metonic? You want to do it or you want me to do it? So, so we formed, so I think of apogee as the secret sauce. So when we, so metonic is, is the backbone. They do the asset management work, we do the finance work, we do the legal work, we put the partnerships together, all of those kind of things. Kind of the core, you know, the, the core thing uh, that makes the, the spine of our organization, the spine of real estate investing. You know, we've all probably had the opportunity, including me, to invest with the brother, the sister, the friend, the brother-in-law that's got some great real estate thing, and we did that, and in my case, that's almost always worked out horribly. Um, we've got the spine of, you know, that, that takes care of all of those things, the reporting, the distributions, all of that stuff happens within, and I think of that as being really largely what Metonic is. Um, when we created Apogee, it's a, it's a sister organization, well said. Um, it's the same company at the end of the day. But it's really designed, and I would say that its mandate is to be the innovator. And so it's to come up with things that make us different from the crowd, that drive a better result for all of our partners, and that's been successful. And so that's largely you know, taking the time to figure out what the apartmentium is. Uh, largely taking the time to figure out how to conduct a, you know, a value add strategy on a property that we're buying that drives a rent that's 100 or $150 different than what the former tenants were paying. Um, how to take something that's old and make it feel like it's new again. Um, you know, thinking about modern day amenities and all those kind of things. I think of Apogee as being our brand that, that does that, uh, being very attentive to, to uh, where consumers are at and where consumer choices are at and uh, making sure that we're thinking about you know, housing in much the same way that people not just in our part of the country are thinking about it, but thinking about it in terms of how people across the country are thinking about it. We spend a lot of time, when I go look for at apartments, I don't, I don't go look around Omaha that much. We go, we go to California, we go to, we go to different places to see how are they doing development in those spaces and then trying to bring some of those ideas back here. I think it's Apogee, I'll let Cassie, since she leads the company, lead, talk about it here in a second, but they're the ones that make, that execute on those ideas and make those kind of things happen. I don't have a ton to add to that, just that our mission is to create raving fans and not only of the people who use our real estate, who work in our real estate, but who live and invest in our real estate. And so we keep that mission in the forefront of what we do by creating those raving fans and um, innovate, renovate, create is, is our tagline. So a couple more questions here, and I think, Susie, you might be the best one to answer this, but the question was, interest rates have remained at historic lows for the last couple of years, and you talked a little bit about this, but maybe elaborate. Um, as there has been significant concern about inflation in the near future, is there any thought that we could see a significant increase in interest rates over the next year to 18 months? Um, no, no, so I'm, I'm just thinking more, more, the, more, more the year to 18 months, and I actually think this goes a little bit to the question in the back of the room relative to the multifamily market. Um, so, I mean, I think what we've seen from an interest rate perspective is obviously, as I discussed, I mean, we've seen the 10-year pop in the last month pretty significantly, but again, I would remind everyone, still lower today than we were in March and April earlier this year. Um, and so, but I mean, I think the Fed has, pr I don't think we're going to see any significant, I mean, based on what they've said across the board, I don't think we're going to see any significant movement from them in the next 12 to 18 months. But I think in terms of the question that was asked earlier about the long term and how long the cycles go, I mean, I think Bob hit it on the head, historically 10 to 15 years. But I think what we're seeing here is even if we see interest rates rise maybe more like two, three years down the road, the inflation piece is still such a huge issue that I think everyone's still trying to wrap their head around that if you don't, you know, even if there's a global market issue, if you don't want to hold your money in cash, everyone consistently goes back to multifamily real estate to be a fairly safe conservative investment vehicle. I mean, not compared to cash bonds, whatever, but 
fairly consistent given the returns that you're getting on a long-term basis. And you know, even though we saw a drop in that in 2008, 2009, it wasn't nearly the drop that you saw across the board. The other thing that I don't think we've touched on too much today, but um, my specialty, although we do about half of our business as regular market rate housing, is affordable housing. And um, Section 8 deals, low income properties, um, government subsidized stuff. And I also think there's a piece that Matonic talked about earlier relative to um, what I'm going to call the 80% AMI world. Not like aggressively affordable, but affordable to the, to the working class. And, um, you know, that when you looked at the, the last downturn, there really wasn't a huge drop in that market. And so I think as we start to see inflation become more of an issue, I think we're going to start seeing possibly more money dropped into multifamily. Um, and so, but, you know, you still have to, as Bob said, you still have to have the people be able to afford it. So I think if we do see significant job losses and everything like that, you'll see an income. Um, I mean, you'll see a drop possibly in rents, but long term, I think it just depends on what your strategy is. I mean, we have a lot of clients who say that they're going to buy properties and flip them in three years. And that's a very different strategy than, you know, a longer term hold where you can kind of just hold out and see where the market turns um, 10, 15 years. I mean, I think you're only really for lack of a better term, screwed if you have to sell. Um, so. Any questions before I keep going down this list that people are curious about? Yeah, Tim. On the liquidity part of uh, real estate investments, when is it liquid? Like, when can you get money out of your investment when you invest in the real estate side? Anybody can answer this one. I think Metonic generally projects out 10 years on their even 15 years but it's a case-by-case -case basis of what they've been telling me and it's like depending it, any projection you make more than three years is wrong <laughs> it's the way I look at it it's going to be wrong it's just you want to be on the right side of the ledger and so when you get out six seven eight years it, if you're just an investor you're, you're uh, a limited partner so you you have to realize you don't have control over that uh, Metonic as general partner does but they're also working in the best interest of all the investors. So when we come in as a group, we feel like we have a little bit more power. But um, I personally don't want to liquidate because it's throwing off enough cash. I just do more deals. But that's what a question my clients ask all the time. When can I liquidate? I say, we'll find another buyer if you need to get out. It's not guaranteed, like push a button to sell Apple computer. But there's going to be another. If it's a property is successful, there's going to be a buyer. And we just have to manually find that buyer for you. And it, that's what we've been doing. Yeah. So I might, the one thing I would add to that is that, is that one of the reasons we think that now is a better time to build than, to, than probably to buy, we're still going to buy, but it's harder to find buys. One of the reasons we think it's better to build now is we just think the returns are better with building. And so in the deals that, that Cassie is, is setting to develop, the idea would be that capital comes into those deals on the front end of building them. We build them. It takes 18, 24 months to do that, whatever it is, lease them up and stabilize them. Probably the way we've modeled this on the back side of that, somewhere around 35 to 50 percent of your initial equity comes back at the point at which we stabilize that. And then on the back side of that, once we've stabilized it and financed it going forward, you've got an 8 or a 10 percent annual cash return. That's what our history has been. So on Rebello, when we financed Rebello, about 70 percent of the initial equity came, came out. So the, the equity that's building phase two at, at Rebello 192 came from phase one. <coughs> Um, we didn't raise any additional outside equity in order to do that. And so you are getting, you know, a stream of money back that you can invest in other things um, as, we're going through the, as we're going through the process of doing that. Metonic does not, so, so Metonic looks at these on a deal by deal basis. And we make decisions about where we see the marketplace at any given point in time. We do sell. I mean, we've sold occasionally. Our, our, there was a you know period of time a few years ago we sold three or four deals and we sold a couple of deals in San Antonio we sold a deal in in a, in Lubbock because we just thought that that was the we, we sold a deal in South Bend Indiana we sold a deal in in uh, in Indianapolis because we just thought that was the ultimate ultim that was the the best time to do that in that property's life cycle we're not 
we're not a real estate fund, and so there's not any predetermined date around when we have to do anything. But we're looking at you know where we think there's the best opportunity um, all for that property as well as for the investors that are that are in that in that deal to to do that. But we don't want anybody to think that. When we talk about liquidity, that means you're getting nothing. Some right. folks have said, "Well, I won't get anything." Well, no, you'll get you'll get the cash returns. You'll get as we finance Trey and his group finance pr really, really well. As we do that, there's oftentimes, you know, good chunks of dough that come back out of those things that can lead to other investments along the way. Yeah, I'll add to that that on the deals we've done, we've had distributions at 50 to 100 percent, and we still own the property at the same value. So in a way, you had liquidity. But my clients ask me that question a lot, and, and it's probably two more parts to that question is that first slide I put up. You don't put all your money in this, number one. You have to evaluate your liquidity needs for the long term. And that's why it's part of a properly balanced portfolio. And so we're, we're going 20 to 40%. Because if you look at your whole portfolio, how much are you gonna spend of that, or are you just trying to spend the income? And you might say, well, that's a limitation to have non-liquidity. But if we can deliver returns that are double digit, or you're high teens, or even, three, five percent more over things that are liquid with that same volatility risk, that's a superior investment. I get clients coming sometimes go, well, I'm 75 years old. I, I'm too old to do that. And I said, oh, are we going to spend this money? And they say, no, it's never spend money. So once I classify it as never spend money, because most people don't want to spend their principal down, but they might have a need from time to time. We need to make room for that. But once it's never spend money, I said, I don't care what your age is. It's a beautiful asset to hold. In, you want, if you're going to go stick it in the bank and make one-tenth of one percent or a bond at three percent, it's never spend money. Why don't I make 12 percent on it or 18 percent on it? We're going to grow your net worth more aggressively. Then what are you going to do? Because you're not selling it. You're going to give it to your kids. They're going to get out of all that depreciation recapture. It's a perfect asset to pass on to your kids. That's going to be high performing while you wait. So you have to decide, is this never spend money? Is it, if it's money you need in the next five years, don't do that with that portion of your portfolio. Carve out that portion of your portfolio in other assets that provide that liquidity need for you. This is for assets that's long term. And I think all of us have assets that are long term. Yeah, yeah Joe. Or, or are there any other uh, favorable tax treatments now for real estate that are uh, under threat? Well, I, I think depreciation, I haven't heard anything about that being a threat. I mean, some of the depreciation, like bonus depreciation, very aggressive. I don't think it has sunset laws on it, but I haven't seen anything on depreciation. It's really the, the 1031 exchange being attacked, paying higher rates on your capital gains, and getting rid of the step up in basis, which is probably the most dangerous of, of all of them. Yeah, a couple other things that are that are out there. Um, one that probably affects sponsors more than it affects investors, but there is some discussion about treatment of carried interests and how carried interests are going to be treated. Carried interests are more payments that come back to the sponsor, but that is on the you know on the agenda. The other one that's a, a big deal that's part of that plan. It's not really my area of expertise, but a big deal is there are looking at some changes on how grantor trusts work and how you can essentially gift property into a grantor trust before death and that's been a really good estate planning mechanism that a lot of our investors and owners have used over the years that's also something that you know is part of that american families plan so there's there are a few other things that are you know that are part of the part of the plan but i think for most you know, kind of individual investors i think it's the it's those main three that we talked about yes sir Say you have to be accredited, that's sure can't be. You cannot be. If you 
investment requires a credit investment. Oh. You can't. So we're trying to make, well, here's the real issue with IRAs in real estate, and, and people do them, but we warned you sternly to be very, very careful. Something called unrelated business income. It's a very technical concept. But basically, if you're, and, and the good news is the audit rate's almost zero, so people are doing it not getting caught. But if you get caught, it's pretty dangerous. It'll blow up your whole IRA. You get taxed on the whole thing. If you have an investment in there that has debt financing on it, like real estate does, it's called unrelated business income. So the day that K-1 shows a profit, your IRA owes 15% tax rate on it, or whatever corporate rates are. So our custodian is sending letters to people saying, we want to look at all your K-1s. Because you have more than $1,500 of profit, your IRA owes taxes. And that's a very distasteful to think, well, my IRA is supposed to be deferred until I take it out. You're going to pay tax in the IRA and tax when you take it out both. But there are investors doing that. And I just warn them, CPA, that's pretty dangerous to do it. You're getting away with it. So I drive back from Lincoln at 80 miles an hour and no cop pulled me over. It, it doesn't mean I was legal. It just means I didn't get caught. And there's a lot of people doing that. So I don't mean to be a downer on it, but they, uh, those private investments in IRAs are a target. They're starting to make the 1090, uh, the 5498 comes out in the middle of the summer, says the value. They're starting to make them list on there the value of alternative investments that you have in your account. They're going to hunt them down. And so if you have that, you might want to find a way of getting out of it here at some point. I don't know when, because uh, they're not very good at finding them and the audit rate's zero, but they're starting to look at it, and I'd be concerned. Is that, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yeah. All right, I've got, I've got one more question that was asked, and I think Bob or Aaron, maybe Adam wants to weigh in on this, but we've talked a lot about the differences between investing in acquisition, something that we buy and do some CapEx work and hold for a long time, uh, versus investing in new properties. How should investors think about allocating investment amounts between developments and stabilized acquisitions over the next year or two? I kind of hope you're going to ask about how the Cornhuskers were going to beat, beat Adam's Hawkeyes in a few weeks, but not going um, to happen. Not gonna happen so. Um, I, so I, I generally think investors should have. So I think of I think of your investments in real estate should be just as diversified as your investments in anything else that you're doing. I think folks should have a little bit of stabilized new construction investment and some you know more aggressive value add plays in their portfolio as well, but they're, but they're different investments. And so, you know, if you buy a, we've got a couple of stabilized deals that, you know, we'll be closing on here in the next couple of months. And, uh, you know, the projection is, is that those deals are gonna, you know, generate a eight to 10% annual cash on cash return based on what they are. It might take a minute for us to get to that point because we're gonna be doing some work to fix the properties up and using some equity to do that. But once those properties, you know, 12 or 14 months out, start distributing on a regular basis. If you invested $100,000 in in, uh, in that property, you should expect to get eight to $10,000 back on an annual basis, you know, for that deal. And we're probably gonna own it for roughly 10 years. That's generally how we model. And when we sell it on the backside of that, you'll probably double or a little bit better than that on that, that initial equity that you've got. So 10 years out, if you invested 100, you probably should get 200 back, maybe 250 back as, as you do that. And that's a pretty safe bet. I mean, that's, Pretty, pretty safe, not tons of risk around that. That's how that works. On the development front, it's just a different equation. So you're, you know, so you're gonna invest that 100 grand, it's gonna take you know, a couple of years unless you know, everything works out great and we're way ahead of that, but you won't get anything in, during that period of time. Assuming that we hold it and we wanna own it for a long time, which is generally our bias, we'll finance it permanently with Susie or whoever, got the best debt rate that we've got. And when we do that, on that initial $100,000 investment, you'll get so on Ravello, a person that invested $100,000 got $71,000 of their initial equity back when we financed the deal. I think on Latitude 41, it was half of it roughly. It was about $50,000 in your initial 100,000. Then then you own that property going forward. And so then you get another 8% on top of that as you roll forward in that, but much riskier. The return on the development side should be a lot better because there's a lot that can go wrong and it, it can. I mean, we've been on a really good run. Things have gone really well. We think we're doing all the right things to, you know, to make sure that those developments go well going forward. I think the market's in the right shape, all of that. But there's a lot to happen. It's got to get built. It's got to get leased up. It has to be at the rents we want. Interest rates have to stay you know, relatively low. And so from a risk profile, that's a, that's a harder thing to do. 
I do hear occasionally from folks that only want to be in acquisition deals because they're anxious about, they just want the immediate cash return that that brings. I do think that makes sense, but I have to wonder a little bit as Ron, you know, is even talking about, what are you really, do you really need the money back? Like I don't, I don't go to my 401k and pull money out every month because I need money out of my 401k. So that's probably the, the, the challenge that I would say to somebody is, you know, I, I get that at some level, you should have a little bit of both, but I, I wouldn't be, unless you like really need, and if you really need that money, you probably shouldn't, to Ron's point, probably shouldn't be investing in multifamily real estate anyway. You should be doing something else with, with that investment, but you should have a little bit of both. I would argue at various times, you should have a little bit of office investment, a little bit of retail investment, probably not today, but at some point, that's probably something you should think about as well. Yeah. Maybe just add to that, I can give you kind of our personal opinion too. And I, uh, Bob's hitting the nail on the head here too, is your development project for the first few years has no cash flow. But after about year three, it is a stabilized asset. So even if you're kind of classifying, hey, if we wanted to do half new development, half stabilized or kind of acquisition deal, all of that development at some point becomes like an acquisition deal. So don't lose sight of that. And generally, so how we try to think of it is stagger any of your development. So you know maybe it's one project a year or maybe a couple, whatever kind of your budget assumes, but stagger those out over a few years and give yourself kind of five years to get those to stabilized, right? So if that's kind of how you're thinking about it, so you'll constantly have this portion of your real estate that's really not returning anything to you in the form of cash flow backed up by everything that is, whether that was an acquisition or a, a development project that's now just graduated to uh, that stream of income. So, um, and, and yeah, absolutely have diversification. I mean, that's definitely key. Uh, and also market diversification. I think that's something we didn't really hit on a whole lot, but that I think Matonic does a great job is, look, a lot of you, I, I think are probably from Omaha, the Omaha area, you know, the Midwest is definitely an underserved market, but there's more markets than just Omaha. Um, and if, Mar if Omaha has an issue with, you know, a major employer or just gets overbuilt for whatever reason, you could have a five or 10 year period where your returns just don't look very good. So, you know, it's looking at the Springfields, it's looking at the Sioux Falls, it's looking at, you know, Texas, you know, there's a lot of oil beta there, but it's probably different than the beta you're gonna get to these markets. Um, and then from a return perspective, we generally look at trying to get somewhere in the ballpark of 300 to 600 basis points more return on a development deal over a 10 year hold than an acquisition. So three to 6% on top. So if an acquisition is gonna get you 10% return over a 10 year hold, we try to get somewhere in the ballpark of 13 to 16% on a development, very base case, very conservative underwriting for us to even consider it. So hopefully higher, um, albeit you know that's getting tough with construction costs and that sort of stuff, but um, that's generally how we think of it personally. That may not work for you, but um, yeah. Well, I always hear Josh tell everybody they should just invest in everything. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really not a ton to add to that. I think that's right. I think it's important to be diversified and to, you know, to have a little bit of both.